Good evening, everyone. It's so lovely to be up here. This is our second public lecture since COVID, and it's just great to see faces again in the, per in the flesh. Um, I'm Amy Marceau de Gallen, the Senior Curator of European Art here at the Nelson Atkins, and I want to thank you all for joining us for the much anticipated annual Murphy Lecture. In 1979, Dr. Franklin D. Murphy, former Chancellor of the University of Kansas, established a visiting lecture program sponsored by the Art History Department at KU, KU Spencer Museum of Art, and the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. For a little over four decades, the Murphy Lectureship has allowed the region to benefit from a visiting art historian, curator, critic, or artist of exceptional achievement. And this year, we are delighted to co-host Dr. Carl Cosero, whose presentation this evening is entitled, Man and the Moon, Humanizing the Heavenly Body. Dr. Cousero is the John Wilmerding Curator of American Art at the Princeton University Art Museum. He is also Associated Faculty at Princeton's High Meadows Environmental Institute and a periodic lecturer in the Department of Art and Archaeology. An individual with many professional accolades, in 2018-19, he co-organized the exhibition Nature's Nation, American Art and Environment with Alan C. Braddock and co-edited and contributed to this catalog, Yale University Press, which won multiple awards. Dr. Cousero recently edited and contributed to Picture Ecology, Art and Eco-Criticism and Planetary Perspectives, Princeton University Press 2011, or 2021 rather, excuse me, and is currently preparing object lessons in American art to accompany a traveling exhibition that focuses on thematic approaches to the field in 2023-24. His other exhibitions and associated publications include Inner Sanctum, Memory and Meaning in Princeton's Faculty Room at NASA Hall, Princeton 2010, and the award-winning Picturing Power, Portraiture and Its Uses in the New York Chamber of Commerce, Columbia 2013, as well as an edited volume of essays on early American art at Princeton. Dr. Cousero attended Wesleyan University and received his PhD from Yale University. This fall, he is participating in a graduate seminar taught by KU's own art history professor, Marnie Kessler, entitled Visual Ecologies of Europe and North America, which considers the representation of the natural world and its social, cultural, material, and political implications across the long 19th century, mainly in the US and Europe, through the lenses of eco-criticism and materiality. He will return to give a lecture December 1st at KU. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cousero. Hello, everyone. Can we get these down just a little bit? That's great. Thanks. I'll be with you in one minute as soon as I get this computer fired up. Okay. All right. Well, good evening, uh, all of you. It's nice to see such a, a, a nice group here. Thank you for being here, uh, for spending some of your Friday evening thinking together about the moon. Uh, thank you, Amy, for that kind introduction. Um, thank you to the Nelson Atkins for hosting this event. Uh, and thank you to the esteemed Crest Department of Art History at KU uh, for hosting me these past few days uh, here. Uh, and above all, uh, thanks to one of my oldest and dearest friends, uh, esteemed KU art historian Marnie Kessler, uh, for thinking to invite me. Uh, Marnie and I met long ago in graduate school, uh, indeed uh, possibly a geological age ago, uh, depending upon when the current age, the Anthropocene is determined to have begun. Uh, some say that's as far back as the Industrial Revolution, <laughs> some uh, with the rise of the nuclear era when radioactive isotopes infiltrated nearly everywhere, eradicating for good the notion of a pure, untouched nature. And some say later when the parts per million of atmospheric carbon passed a certain threshold. 
many of us in this audience have, in fact, a foot in each of two geological epochs, something which is unprecedented in human, bear with me, history. The one just ending, the Holocene, began 12,000 years ago with the last ice age. It's the era of human civilization and development. The Anthropocene is the time of human impact beyond ourselves as a species on a global scale. That trajectory from a world in which we are constituents, as it were, of Earth, to one in which we are in the driver's seat, and it appears in environmental terms driving toward a cliff, uh, has informed my own trajectory as a scholar and as a citizen. Which brings me to the subject of this evening's talk, which all began, in a way, with my iPhone. This is the wallpaper on my home screen and the app screens that follow. Uh, I don't recall if they were preloaded or my choice, but in any case, I've often thought about the juxtaposition of the two as I swipe back and forth, the kind of uh, yin and yang of these screens, seemingly opposite things that are yet connected, not least by gravity, which holds the moon in our orbit. The Earth, vibrant, complex, colorful, warm, with touches of green and brown. The moon, stark, cold, monotone, barren. Indeed, yin in Chinese is semantically related to the moon, along with connotations like passive, negative, and hidden. How do these great bodies relate the one to the other in human history? And how do our varying understandings of the moon inform who we are, especially from my perspective as an eco-critic, which, although it may sound, and people have sometimes asked whether that means I'm someone criticizing the environment, is really just the opposite. Eco-criticism is a way of apprehending cultural artifacts, art, literature, anything creative made by humans, with particular attention to how they engage or construct both ecology, which is simply the relationship of living things to their surroundings, and the environment, which is the diverse forms those surroundings take. Put another way, eco-criticism looks at how humans have considered their relationship between ourselves and everything beyond us. And as an art historian, I'm particularly interested in the role art and representation play in this question. So art, or let's call it visual representation, since much of what we'll be looking at this evening extends beyond the narrowly artistic, has always been a means through which humans can approach ultimate questions of history, existence and reality, and destiny, as here, in a famous work of Paul Gauguin, with its searching title picking up each of these themes. While Gauguin is lately considered by many a colonizing misogynist, before he went to Tahiti and perhaps became these things, he studied religion. And it was prior to ingesting arsenic in a failed suicide attempt that he completed this painting, in which he sought to represent and symbolize the great issues of his title in terms of the human lifespan. And in this case, he's moving sort of counterintuitively from right to left so that you can see the stages of life evinced through the child at the far right and then the youth uh, eating the forbidden fruit in the center and then old age at the right. But these ultimate questions, of course, extend well beyond the span of human life and visual culture has engaged them. So what, does the, so what does the ways the moon has been represented across time say about some of the question that Gauguin's painting raises, or at least about human perspectives on the non-human other? Our largest, closest, and indeed only major satellite, the moon is perhaps the major symbol of the unearthly, the realm outside the human. I'm having cursor trouble, sorry. I began this project uh, with the intent of looking not just trans-historically, but also cross-culturally at conceptions and representations of the moon. 
And while we'll do some of that at the beginning, I was soon disabused of the notion that one could, in a single talk, do justice to a topic so truly immense. And my bookshelf, if I can get it to you, attests to this. And these are just the, the general overviews. Books have been written as well on images of the moon, including in a single medium of photography, and region, America, which is uh, my specialty when I'm not thinking about the moon. So our focus tonight will be largely on Western conceptualizations of the moon, visually and informing that ideologically, both because that's our own and most familiar tradition, and because with the evening's eco-critical theme of human perceptions of non-human life, which is the thing I might offer that is different from all those books we just saw, because Western ideology, including its pervasive spread in recent times, has had by far the most to do with creating the dominant paradigm of the day for good or ill. Really, the very idea that one could consider a more comprehensive treatment of how the moon has been considered itself across time and place speaks to the degree to which our world has foreclosed conscious apprehension of it and other national phenomena. The moon looms less large in our consciousness today with all its competition. Which returns us to my iPhone. Our world has become so technologically focused that distraction from the natural world seems all but unavoidable and its mediation via technology foreordained. You may be familiar with the image at right. It's a riff on a famous painting by romantic painter Caspar David Friedrich, Wanderer Above the Sea Fog, although here he's um, interpreting that through the lens of his phone. Friedrich was an important painter of, of the romantic moon, incidentally, and we'll, we'll get to him a little bit at the end of the lecture. So you thought you were coming to an art lecture. Well, <laughs> one last, uh, I think, telling detour before we get to historical representations of the moon. How did the thing itself get here? This is worth asking because the answer has varied quite significantly over time and meaningfully. Indeed, changing beliefs about this in even our own scientific era provide a metaphor for what, as you'll see, is really the overarching narrative of this talk. The human impulse even need to make the unfamiliar familiar by drawing it into the realm of human understanding and control. We as a species are uncomfortable with foreign things, with things unknown. And so let's look briefly at the latest two theories of the moon's origin, the capture theory from the late 1800s and the more recent and prevailing collision theory. In the former, the Earth drew the moon to itself from afar, captured it via gravitational force, literally drawing it into its orbit and, if such a theory can be read symbolically, into its zone of familiarity. This theory has now been supplanted, however, with the collision theory in which another planet-like entity, often called Thea, collided with the Earth four and a half billion years ago causing what then became the moon to break away. This is what the diagram shows. In this theory, the moon thus, come, thus turns out to be actually of the Earth, not something from afar, a scenario that works well with our human proclivities. Yet who knows if this is right? We tend to see current thinking as fact, it's worth remembering that those before us, however, saw their own very different conceptualizations the same way. All this remains theory, hypothetical, and subject to change, and thus is significant not only for the scientific thesis itself, but for the implications of that thesis as they relate to the human desire to familiarize what is, cosmologically speaking, near at hand. Indeed, here's another diagram presenting other more recent options for the moon's formation, since the collision theory already, as first propounded just 20 years or so ago, is now in doubt. So truly, we don't know. 
So all the moon, though, although the moon may have receded in popular consciousness, as we burrow into our iPhone, most of us still know the basics. It orbits the Earth, shows the same side always, the man and the moon as we've humanized it, and over roughly a month presents itself in varying degrees over eight phases because the moon orbits both the Earth and the Earth because the moon orbits the Earth and the Earth orbits the sun. So the sun's light illuminates the moon in varying degree depending upon the relative positions of each. This is uh, Johannes von Loon's engraving of the eight phases of the moon, moving clockwise from the top, from new moon to full moon and back again. It's from a famous so-called star atlas of the 17th century when, for reasons you'll see, imaging of the moon made a quantum leap. I show it here because it's a particularly beautiful graphic representation of the lunar cycle and because it suggests, I think, an a way to organize this presentation. I'd like to propose that the ways the moon has been represented across time can, like its phases, be meaningfully batched into eight groups, extending from prehistory all the way to today. That's uh, an enormous amount of ground to cover, so this evening I think we'll tackle just the first four. It's not the entire story, perhaps, but it's a story in itself. And for the rest, uh, I hope you'll consider attending virtually or in person the lecture that Amy kindly mentioned uh, in this mini-series of sorts, uh, details of which I can provide you at, at the end of this one. And it will be streamed, so you won't have necessarily to uh, head to Lawrence, although I'm sure you'd be warmly welcome there. In both these talks, I'll be proceeding from my eco-critical perspective, meaning with an orientation towards what ideas about the moon reveal about ideas about people in relation to the non-human and how significant that turns out to be. So we'll chart human conceptualization of the moon as reflected and inflected in graphic representation of it. That is, as ideas about the moon are mirrored and embodied in images of and related to it, and also as those images in turn inform ideas about it. So although that looks like a coffee bean, uh, this is actually the first phase of Van Loon's chart. And the reason it's ovoid like that is because it's in the gutter uh, of, of the, the book that was a, uh, a, the fold. Um, it's distorted for that reason. The new moon shown here is, is visually the absence of the moon uh, when it cannot actually be seen because in this phase, the Earth blocks the illuminating light of the sun. And that, in a way, seems appropriate for our first phase concerning representations of it, since in these earliest iterations, the moon itself is not portrayed. Rather, it is the trace of its observation that is recorded as a means of marking time via its appearance and various phases, which provide the basis for early calendrical systems, 12 cycles roughly a year. In this sense, representing the moon was initially and for thousands of years indexical versus symbolic or iconic as it was later. An index being a type of sign where the signifier is caused by the signified but does not look like it. For example, smoke is an index of fire. The earliest instance we have of the trace of the moon in human history are the marks or notches on a prehistoric baboon fibula found in Eswatini, which is now Swaziland, or rather had been Swaziland, and dating to about 43,000 before the Common Era. These marks are the index of the moon, constituting its representation insofar as the notches were caused by observation of it. They result from it like smoke from a fire in this case, indexing the moon's appearance on a given day. Similarly, the marks on the Blanchard bone from the Dordogne in France, made from an eagle's wing thousands of years later, and incorporating a series of notched marks in a serpentine pattern, following the line outwards and back and forth, there are about 15 marks in each sweep before the direction changes. 
corresponding to the days between the extremes of the lunar cycle, new and full moon. From not so long after, the Venus of Lossel is an 18-inch high limestone bas-relief of a nude woman in which the color and the number of notches on the horn she holds is thought to represent the number of lunar cycles in a year. And it has been suggested that the horn may not actually represent that, but rather is an evocation of the crescent moon. If this is the case, we see here a major shift from indexical representation to iconic, in which the thing referred to looks like the thing portrayed. Anticipating the more famous cave paintings in nearby Lascaux from about 10,000 years later, where representation now engages realism, and in which the two systems index and icon coincide. And the indexical part uh, of this image are the dots beneath the animals, which are thought to represent, as on the bone, uh, the, the, the trace of the moon's appearance on, on given days. What do the indexical, calendrical representations of the moon tell us about the evolution of human consciousness and how did they help structure the human world? Two things, one of them not environmental or ecological especially, but deeply important and fascinating nonetheless. Observation of the moon, including its monthly absence and inevitable subsequent reappearance, is thought to have facilitated the capacity in humans for abstract conceptual thought, such that the invisible phase of the moon, the new moon, must be considered as part of its cycle, even when there's no evidence, no visual sign of its existence. And second, the same cyclical nature of the moon offered a master explicatory paradigm Sorry. So sorry, I'm, I'm having a cursor issue here. Okay, beg your pardon. Uh, uh, master explicatory paradigm for human, animal, and vegetable life. Uh, one of transformation through successive birth, growth, decline, death, rebirth, and renewal. On epic scale, the moon's reliable cycle offered a means of understanding the cycle of life itself. Okay, phase two. Uh, the title for which, uh, or at least the first part of it, may seem contradictory. Aren't deification and, and personification opposites? Uh, one connoting the divine, the other the human. Not when it comes to representing the moon in the years between Lascaux and the rise of monotheistic Christianity thousands of years later. The earliest religions, uh, like, I suppose, depending upon your perspective, later ones as well, uh, revolved around mythology, allegorical narratives through which aspects of creation, the structure of the world, power relations in it, and other fundamental abiding questions of humanity are parsed and explained. The main actors in these narratives are not human, they are gods, deified. But because humans invented them and because humans seek the familiar, they commonly have human attributes. They are personified. With regard to the moon, nearly all ancient cultures included and represented it in their mythology, usually in a way at once deified with the special attributes and power of the divine and personified with certain aspects of their appearance relating to that of human, uh, excuse me, of human beings. This process of sacralizing, making sacred, the moon through its symbolic representation in the form of human-like gods and goddesses was hugely uh, pervasive. And here's a, a sampling from a vast array of possibilities. 
Uh, proceeding from upper left, uh, it's Nana, Mesopotamian, moon god, Osiris, Egyptian, Chandra, Hindu, uh, Chang'e, who's Chinese, uh, Ishel, this is Mayan, uh, Selene, and Luna, uh, respectively Greek and Roman. And you can see in the latter two cases how the one clearly comes out of the other. As is the case with so much uh, of, of Roman art and culture. Many cultures had several, even numerous gods affiliated, affiliated in some way with the moon. As this selection attests, they are both female and male in their attributes. Generalizing now somewhat, moon gods, initially largely male, became feminized over time as the process known as solarization the shift in orientation from a lunar-centric to a solar-centric cosmology took hold. In the slide, the oldest gods, uh, Nana and Osiris, are male, whereas the later ones like Selene and Luna are female. Ecocritically speaking, the reason for this crucial shift from moon god to sun god has a lot to do with, and indeed can essentially be explained by, parallel shifts in the human orientation to and attitudes toward the non-human environment, specifically with a steady ascendance of animal and agricultural husbandry over thousands of years and the sun's critical role in it in promoting growth and determining seasons. And that term for mastery of the earth's resources by humans, husbandry, it says it all in terms of gender and the biases of gender historically. The move from male moon gods to female ones, with the male gods becoming oriented more toward the sun, and I'm showing you here the Egyptian sun god Re, uh, the Greek Helios, and the Hindu Surya, uh, all male, was an artifact of the evolution that solarization engendered, of organized patriarchal societies structured around agricultural development as it became increasingly entrenched. This transition from lunar to solar orientation in Western culture was crystallized in the discovery by Anaxagoras in the fifth century BCE that the moon does not transmit its own light, rather it is reflected from the suns. It has no power, no agency of its own. Socrates soon spoke of the sun in his, note the gender, revolution always adding new light to the moon which borrowed it. A few years later, Plato's Republic equates the image of the good with the image of the sun. The good, he argues, acts like the sun. Hence, the sun is soon primacy in a world increasingly governed by agriculture and its related social structures. Thus, as humans took control of their environmental surroundings, cultivating and manipulating it to serve their ends, their relationship to nature fundamentally shifted. They became the shaper and master of nature as opposed to a part of it, undifferentiated from other living things, and in this process necessarily became more distinct, more separate from other living things outside themselves. The personification of moon deities, whose changing gender affiliations reflect the rise of a worldview predicated on power and mastery over nature, and who all had human characteristics, including foibles and faults, was perhaps a means of keeping the non-human world close as human evolution led to its increasing estrangement. Our third phase is the half moon, and in our named sequence, the iconic veristic phase of moon representation. By these terms, I mean in the language, again, of semiotics, signs where the signifier resembles the signified, that is, where representations of the moon actually begin to look like it. This is new, uh, despite the odd crescent shape signaling the moon in a few of the images we've seen, and here they are. Images of it as such do not emerge until surprisingly late. 
This, though, is with the exception of a single controversial and very early outlier, the so-called Nebra Sky Disk. This 12-inch diameter bronze and gold artifact, it's quite beautiful, I, th I think, uh, was unearthed by treasure hunters in Germany. And there's a controversy as to actually how old it is. I've given it the date 1600 BCE, which is the sort of prevailing wisdom. But uh, others think it's much younger, uh, as much as a, a, a thousand years younger. But whether it's late bronze or, or Iron Age, it is regardless remarkable uh, as the earliest known map or image of the heavens and the moon, perhaps twice if that large round circle represents the full moon and not the sun. The constellation at right is Pleiades, uh, thought to inform the similar cluster of small gold spheres in the disk's upper right quadrant. I thought that might perk a few people up. <laughs> Yet, you know, one can't resist noting, considering our interest this evening in the humanization of the moon as an evolving construct and how people relate to the non-human, the possible impulse, I don't know what you think, of, of its maker, likely unconscious, in doing just that. It's fascinating to consider how such opposite icons, the distant heavens and the proximate face, have been made, consciously or not, to resemble one another, and to consider the implications of that for perceptions of the moon in the cultural imaginary. In any case, to our knowledge, there was nothing like the Never Sky Disk before or for long after it. This isn't to say that attention in and interest, uh, attention to and interest in the moon waned. In the West, as we've seen, Greek philosophers and mathematicians considered the heavens, and additionally, Pythagoras, Aristotle, Plutarch, Pliny, Ptolemy, uh, and a, a host of other people whose name begins with P. Uh, and beyond advanced various theories, uh, often contradictory, but these concern primarily the nature of the moon's orbit and relationship to other planets as against its actual appearance. Depictions of the sky from the Greco-Roman period occasionally include a crescent moon, even more so in Islamic cultures. This schematic mode of representation continued into medieval times where the moon continued to be represented in art in its most easily recognizable form as a crescent. That begins to change with the Renaissance in the West. Giotto, for example, at the beginning of the 14th century, didn't simply repeat prevailing visual formulae. Rather, he depicted the waning crescent moon in his famous Last Judgment from the Arena Chapel in Padua, uh, and you can see them uh, at the upper right of the image on the left and the detail uh, to the right. Uh, those are angels scrolling up the heavens on the day of the, of the last judgment. Uh, Giotto shows the moon just past its third quarter with an unusual man in the moon face whose features move beyond the formalized schema to suggest, however vaguely, the actual distribution of spots on the rugged lunar surface. In the following century, Jan van Eyck painted in the crucifixion scene of a devotional diptych the first truly re realistic portrayal of the moon. During the medieval and Renaissance periods, many artists had depicted the moon in this context, usually on Christ's left, uh, or the Latin for sinister, side, near the bad thief, balanced on the right by the sun to signal the cosmic chaos of this apocalyptic moment. But before Van Eyck did so schematically, uh, sorry, but before Van Eyck they did so schematically, not realistically, showing it as merely an undifferentiated white circle. Van Eyck, by contrast, looked hard and represented what he saw. Two centuries after Giotto, Leonardo does what Van Eyck did, looks closely, but from a different point of view, that of science. Though he's also, of course, an artist, Leonardo is interested here in the moon's appearance as an offshoot of his greater concern, like the Greeks centuries ago, in the physics of its movement 
and importantly, in its placement in the solar system relative to the rest of the things in it. Between Van Eyck's deployment of the moon in a Christian context and Leonardo's in an early scientific one, we begin to see an emerging tension between the desire to know and represent the moon from a mythological or a religious perspective and from a proto-scientific one. Renaissance humanism, by which I mean an attitude that's centered on human interests, values, and pursuits, has brought myth and religion into tension with science, a term not actually coined until the 16th century when Francis Bacon codified the scientific method, that is, the pursuit of knowledge and understanding of the natural and social world following a systematic methodology based on evidence, empiricism uh, in a word. This approach to things began to bring the world of knowledge into tension with the world of belief. The prevailing understanding of the structures of the universe and the human Earth's placement within it, as well as the moon, began to falter as science revealed its flaws. Since at least Ptolemy in the second century, uh, rather the second century Greek polymath, the universe had been constructed around the central Earth a structure which accorded well with religions, certainly Christianity's, essential, essential anthropocentrism, or human-centeredness. But with the publication of Nicholas Copernicus's on the, Re on the Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres in 1543, which is the year of his death, which was probably good timing because he would have been in a lot of trouble with the church had he lived uh, much beyond the publication of his controversial treatise, uh, he advances, it advances the possibility, even the logical scientific likelihood, that it was the Earth that revolved around the Sun and not the other way around, challenging the long entrenched worldview. And these images here are, are actually from the same uh, uh, book, uh, the Van Loon uh, book, uh, that my icons of the phases are borrowed from, and I think they're particularly beautiful. Um, that this book is considered one of the great monuments of uh, 17th century uh, publication, uh, and it's an extraordinarily beautiful thing. Christianity posits a single transcendent God who created in an instant the sun and the moon to light the earth. The book of Genesis says, they will be in the sky to shine light on the earth. That was their purpose for being called into existence. A few verses later, man is created and instructed, and instructed to subdue and have dominion over nature, over every creeping thing, as the verse goes. The result is to separate and remove humans from nature, to place them in special relation to it, above it, in control of it not, as in some other religious traditions, as part of it. Finally, phase four. If the challenge of science to Christianity served to decenter humans from their familiar central perch in the scheme of things, so too its advances rendered the once familiar moon strangely ever more unfamiliar, even as it became better understood all of it with unexpected cultural effects, as, as we'll see. During the so-called scientific revolution of the 16th century and on, the moon came more visibly into view, so to speak, just as it is here in Van Loon's map, corresponding in our sequence appropriately to an era of heightened and unprecedented realism in representing the moon. This image may not look like much, but it's perhaps the most significant one of the moon we'll see tonight in terms of changing perceptions of it. This is the drawing Thomas Harriot, an English astronomer, mathematician, ethnographer, uh, makes in 1609 through the newly invented telescope, which for the first time in human history affords a view of the moon at, in this instance, only six times magnification, but quickly many times more. 
It's a strange image, uh, sketchy in the extreme, showing the moon's terminator, which is the curved line between light and dark, oddly sideways due to the not yet fully understood ref refractive properties of the telescope. Although Harriet's excitement must have been great, there must as well have been an element of disappointment in realizing the moon at six times magnification was no more hospitable looking than with the naked eye, despite the centuries of myth and personification of our closest satellite throughout the ages. A few months later, Galileo Galilei got his hands on a telescope and made the sketches it left, which are quickly published in his treatise with a wonderful title, The Starry Messenger, constituting a quantum leap in perceptions and understanding of the true nature of the moon's surface, appearance, and probable environmental characteristics, all of which were and are decidedly unearthly. This is a later uh, uh, map, moon map, I think is the apt term for it, that, that Harriet uh, makes in comparison with, with uh, Galileo's sketches. These images uh, drew upon two different representational paradigms, one rooted in planographic mapping, one in volumetric pictorialism with light shaping form and providing depth of field. But what both portray is not the moon as a kind of other earth as postulated, hoped for, and anticipated since the time of Plutarch. Rather, it appears as a barren, foreign, lifeless moonscape. Not the personified moon of ancient myth or even the Christianized one of Giotto with its familiar face or of Van Eyck with its contextualization within the biblical narrative. The very tools, science, invention, the telescope, observation, representation of the species, humans, that Christianity had ordained special and superior rendered, rendered the opposite effect. So what to do? Uh, well, a detour, so to speak, uh, that took Harriet on his way to the moon, uh, that Harriet took on his way to the moon offers a clue. In the 1580s, Harriet accompanied two exploratory voyages to America under the aegis of his close friend, Sir Walter Raleigh. Harriet's purpose and Raleigh's was, as the dedication of his resulting brief and true report reveals, to encourage settlement and development by adventurers, favorers, and well-willers of the action for the inhabiting and planting there. Harriet's text presents the then exotic place known today as coastal North Carolina as appealingly as could be, focusing especially on the land's natural abundance and potential for colonization. As for its indigenous inhabitants, Harriet was favorably inclined there as well, taking the trouble to learn enough of their Algonquian dialect to communicate with some of them, describing the native peoples of the area Harriet focused on their peacefulness and amenability in his wrong-headed estimation uh, to likewise be colonized, to become civilized, Christianized. In essence, he portrayed these people, the Secatan, as different, certainly, but also essentially familiar, if less advanced, in his Western estimation. The watercolors of Harriet's fellow explorer, John White, however, stressed something different, an exoticism at odds with Harriet's conducive portrayal. White's images did not appear in the first printing of Harriet's North American adventure, but they did as part of a second, larger edition two years later, as engraved and meaningfully adapted by Theodore de Bry, a Belgian artist and publisher, who shifted the tenor of White's estranging images to make them more familiar and better accommodate the spirit of Harriet's promotional text. And here briefly are three examples comparing the two. Uh, in this one, you note the addition of, of a larger situating context and a more uh, immediate scene that's fleshed out. Uh, the, the crop that you see on the uh, watercolors is actually um, whites um, and Debray provides a, a, a larger situating context. He also adds 
uh, to the bowl more foodstuffs and, and edible uh, things before it, signifying abundance. Uh, he takes the unfamiliar squatting poses of the people at left and, and westernizes them. And the female figure on the right of each is now rendered both more familiar and uh, attractive to Western eyes. She meets the gaze of the viewer, uh, drawing that putative viewer, uh, drawing uh, and the, the target audience was, was uh, certainly male, uh, into the scene, and, and by extension into the place depicted, which is really just the point of the engraving. Other images adopted pictorial techniques to render more familiar what White's original watercolor had portrayed as just the opposite. Doubling, for example, whereby the subject at hand is presented artificially at once from both sides, supplying the effect of enhancing knowledge and familiarity with it. Or adopting a technique from contemporary map making known as garnishing filling the field of representation with repeated recognizable icons. Uh, the crabs at the bottom right in both images, uh, for example, imaged once in the watercolor, but twice in the painting, uh, rather twice in the engraving, thus amplifying the depicted plenitude while subtly diminishing the potentially alienating strangeness of its parts. In these examples and throughout the whole second iteration of Harriet's book, the effect of the pictorial translation from White's originals to De Bry's engravings is to render a potentially overwhelming and threatening environment as not only comprehensible, but also known and familiar. So returning now to the moon, just the same thing happens as Harriet's and Galileo's defamiliarizing apprehension of it is made to seem less so. Though the effect of their images, sorry, could not be altered as readily, uh, no one at the time was making additional comparative images of indigenous North Americans, but anyone with a telescope by then could by the mid 17th century see the moon's actual appearance. So other cultural products were produced uh, to have the similar effect. The image at left, for example, from the years following Harriet and Galileo's drawings shows the literally humanized moon made to conform to the lunar phases despite the need for all sorts of physiognomic contortions. In a similar vein, the concept of the moon as another earth was resurgent in literature such as Francis Godwin's The Man and the Moon, which describes just that, the voyage of a man courtesy of a goose-powered contraption of uncertain flight worthiness uh, to the moon where he dwells amicably among its inhabitants, the lunars, a Christian people uh, inhabiting what appears to be a utopian paradise and stays there for six months before returning unharmed to earth. A more serious-minded treatise with similar ends was John Wilkins' The Discovery of a World in the Moon a discourse, as its subtitle has it, tending to prove that tis probable there may be another habitable world in that planet. Thus did people in the great age of discovery attempt to anthropocentrize even the cold, pale moon. In doing so, they reveal a broader human tendency to colonize the unfamiliar by rendering it otherwise. The attribution of traits favorable to humans, to even the most foreign environments, speaks to our, our species' inability to accept them as they are, to instead fashion them to our likening and possible gain, even when it is the techniques of our own devising that have led us to the realization of the vast difference this world, and that one up there, contains. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll look at the extension of this tension between knowing in rational and scientific terms and knowing in more familiar and emotional ones as it extends through a series of ever more detailed representations of the moon, 
only to reset itself during the Romantic era with the countervailing, self-consciously humanized moon. Uh, as examples here of each, the great, literally five foot wide, almost impossibly detailed uh, image of the moon by 18th century British pastelist John Russell. And another very different uh, painting uh, by Caspar David Friedrich, who you'll remember from the Wanderer with iPhone I showed earlier. Both of these are artists, both realists, yet their apprehension of the moon could not be more different. Russell culminates an approach to knowing and representing the moon that harkens back to Harriet's map. Friedrich and a host of other romantic artists, poets, and writers to something perhaps far earlier when the moon and the humans beneath it existed on a continuum of existence less pocked by the human exceptionalism that has given projects like eco-criticism and talks like this one a certain sense of urgency. So this evening we've uh, traveled halfway around Van Loon's map from new moon nearly to its culmination in the full one. Uh, to return to the slide with which we began on the left, uh, I hope we've seen how the human inhabitants of the sphere uh, on the right of that slide have differently construed the image of the one on the left and something about why. I also hope uh, you'll consider joining us uh, for the rest of the journey, as I say, in person in, in KU or, or online in a few weeks to see how photography modernity, the Anthropocene, actual travel to the moon, uh, and a host of other factors jostle for contention in determining our representation of it in our own age. Uh, meanwhile, thank you very sincerely for being here, and uh, good night. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you all for coming. We've got probably time for maybe one question, if there's one burning question out there. Um, and of course, I'm sure you, you would have to be happy to speak afterwards. But are there any questions out there? It's really hard to see. Oh, yeah. Way in the back, there's one. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I do have a question. Is there any evidence or is there any document um, not documentation, but um, I guess evidence that there was ever a culture or civilization, Greek, Mayan, Arabic, that ever gave the moon a name, a female or male, gave it an actual name like we name, currently name other moons of different planets? Yeah, I, I, if I heard you correctly, forgive me, um, my hearing isn't <laughs> what it once was. Uh, I I think you're asking if, if other cultures have, have named the moon. Yeah, indeed, all, yeah, for sure. Um, and often those names correspond to the names of uh, the gods. Um, but when cultures move beyond that, those names often remain uh, and are applied more directly to the planet, the satellite. But mo our moon. sorry, our moon. our moon. He wanted to, people to name our moon. Our, our, our moon. Yeah, uh, right. Um, I think that's the moon that they're always referring to. I, I, w do you mean moons of other planets? No, our moon. Did it ever have a name other than the moon? Oh. Uh, well, um, in English, you mean? I mean, the, the, uh, uh, it's always had a, a name. Sorry, I, I, I think I'm probably not understanding your question. Right. 
Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 the root in, in Greek is, is, uh, relates again to the, to the god, Selene. Uh, in Latin, it's luna, from which we have lunar. The word moon itself is ancient and, and has, uh, you know, connotations of, uh, the word month comes from moon. I mean, it, so the, the, the affiliation of the word moon goes way back uh, in, in the sort of uh, Hindu-Indo-European Indo, tradition of language because um, it means as well, um, as I say, month, and it goes, that goes all the way back to the kind of calendrical orientation, which is actually sort of prehistorical. And um, the reason that moon and month are cognates, I think, speaks to that. I hope I'm answering your question, but thanks for it. And yeah, if, if you have others, please do come up. I just feel like I've sort of talked enough and you probably have dinner and galleries to go to. Uh, but really, just thanks again for, for coming sincerely. And uh, if you do have an interest, um, I believe the second lecture, which will sort of pick up where well, we, we left off, uh, will be live streamed um, from uh, from the Spencer, uh, where, as I say, I'm sure they, they welcome you personally. Uh, but thanks very much. Thank you.